We've been teaching through the Gospel of John as a church family. If you have a Bible, I wanna invite you to turn to the Gospel of John. We're gonna be in chapter 17 today. If you don't have a Bible, we wanna solve that problem. We wanna give you a Bible. The way that we can do that is if you come to this room right over here, it has a sign over it, it says the altar. If you go through those doors, there's a room and it's a room that we pray for, for folks in. If you need prayer after the gathering, come to the altar room. But we have Bibles in there. We wanna make sure everyone has a copy of God's word. We've actually been reading through the Bible on a daily basis this whole year as a church family and we're finishing up Isaiah. So if you wanna start reading your Bible every day, you could jump in on, in Isaiah if you want and follow along with us. And um, we're just really grateful to have God's word. Today, I'm gonna read John 17, 20 through 26. John 17, 20 through 26. Those seven verses are going to be our text for today. So let me read it. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you and these know that you have sent me. I made them I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, thank you that we have had the freedom to come and gather today. Lord, thank you that we have been able to remember you in communion. We have been able to bring gifts of worship, of offering to you. We've been able to have fellowship with one another, to use our gifts of service, and we're coming to this time to where we're going to have teaching, and we're going to be in your word, and we're going to be taught by you, and so God, we're asking, Lord, that you would speak so loudly through your word, and that you would use your word to transform our lives, and would the Holy Spirit of God take the truth of God's word and put it deep into our hearts, and would we submit to it? God, help us to submit to your word today, that we might be changed, that we would be transformed, that we would be different because we have come to worship the true and living God and to be taught by you. And so, Lord, we need you desperately and we look to you. We look to you and we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said, amen, amen. So this section of John 17, the end of John 17 is a third section of John 17. And the first part of John 17, Jesus is praying to the Father. In the second part of John 17, Jesus is praying at least about the 11 apostles. Judas had already bailed out at this point to betray Jesus. And then we get to the third part of the Gospel of John 17, and it's a prayer about those who will become believers. And what I think is incredible is we have an entire chapter in our Bible of a prayer that Jesus prays. If you just consider that, that is pretty amazing. That an entire chapter of the Gospel of John is an entire prayer from Jesus. The Gospel of John is not laid out proportionately time-wise. What I mean is the first 11 chapters of the Gospel of John cover two to three years. If you consider the first verse, it covers eternity, but it covers two or three years in the timeline of Jesus' ministry. When you get to chapter 12, it goes to hours, days, just the last few weeks of the life of Jesus. And so what we have in John 17, it is the night before he is betrayed. He, you know, J Judas had just left dinner and is gonna go betray him. And Jesus then gives what some refer to as the high priestly prayer. So Jesus, as our great high priest, is now praying to God. He's praying about his followers. And when we think about the fact that Jesus is praying, a question we should ask is, 
In the Bible, can we find anywhere where Jesus prays about us, as in us in this room, as in 2,000 or so years removed from the time of Jesus and his ministry in the New Testament? Is there anywhere where we can look in our Bible and see that Jesus is praying about us? And the answer to that is yes. And it's right here. It is these seven verses. When we look at these seven verses, these seven verses are a prayer about us. So where in the Bible does Jesus pray for us? Well, it's right here in John 17, 20. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So let's break this down. He says, I do not ask. So Jesus is asking some things. He's, he's praying to the Father and he's asking some things. I do not ask for these only. So what are the these? Well, the these are at least, at a minimum, the 11 apostles. It could be that the these refer to the disciples of Jesus beyond the 11 apostles, but it at least at a minimum refers to the 11 disciples. And he says, I'm not praying about the 11 disciples only, the 11 apostles only, but also for those who will. So he is seeing beyond the 11 or the immediate disciples there, and he is seeing that there is going to be an expansion. There's going to be a growth. It's not going to just be 11. It's going to grow into something bigger, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So Jesus is praying ahead of time in expectation that more people are going to believe in him. And how will they believe in him? Through their word. Well, who's the there? Well, the there is the these. The these and the there are the same people. It's the 11 apostles. So he is saying, he's praying to the Father, and he's, and he's praying, I'm now going to spend time praying about when these 11 apostles go out and give the message of Jesus and spread the word about Jesus, people are going to come to know Jesus. And now I'm praying about them. So this is incredible. This is incredible that Jesus is praying in expectation And if you follow that chain of discipleship all the way to now, Jesus is praying in expectation of our belief in Jesus, in him, through the word. So where does Jesus pray for us? Well, he prays for us right here. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus, then this prayer is about you. So if you are here and you know Jesus as God and you know him as Savior and you are redeemed in Jesus Christ, then this prayer is about you. If you do not yet know Jesus, this prayer is not about you yet. But you might come to know Jesus today. And if you come to know Jesus today, then this prayer is about you. And you might be here and be like, no, there's no way I'm coming to know Jesus. Yeah, we'll see about that. We'll see what happens. We'll see if you resist the love of Jesus. Because it might be you're going to come to know Jesus and you're going to find out he prayed about you thousands of years ago. He prayed in expectation of our belief in him through the word. So in the previous chapter in John 16, Jesus told the disciples. So when we see what Jesus prays about, he prays about things he already taught about. So in John 16, he teaches about this. He teaches the 11 apostles He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So Jesus, in the previous chapter, which these chapters are broken up, it's all the same dinner, okay? So when we're looking at this chunk of chapters here, it's all the same evening. It's all the same time. And in chapter 16, it's just earlier in the conversation. When the spirit of truth comes, Jesus is calling the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit's going to guide you. So these 11 apostles are going to be guided into the truth because he, the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit of God, will not speak on his own authority. So the Holy Spirit of God is going to speak on the authority of Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God is going to speak on the authority of the Father. And whatever he hears, so what he hears Jesus or the Father say, he will speak and he, the Holy Spirit, will declare to you the things that are to come. So Jesus teaches the 11 apostles, the word of God is going to come to you through the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 17, he's now praying about when their word spreads, how people are going to come to know Jesus because the apostles spread the word. Now, 
One of those apostles is the, is the apostle John. That is, the, that is the book we are studying. It, it is one of the apostles. So we have the gospel of John because Jesus taught the Holy Spirit is gonna give the word of God to the apostles. Jesus prayed about it in John 17, what we're looking at right here. At the end of John in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, the apostle John helps us understand the reason he wrote the book is for the very same reason that Jesus prayed about. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. So this book is written so that you may believe what? That Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So in chapter 16, Jesus teaches the disciples, the Holy Spirit is going to bring the word of God to you. In chapter 17, he's praying about when that word of God goes out, that more people will believe in Jesus. In John chapter 20, John, the one who writes it, the human author who writes the book, says that's the whole reason I wrote the book. I wrote the book so that you might believe in Jesus. And guess what? 2,000 years later, here we are, and we're looking at the gospel of John. We're looking at our Bibles. We're still looking at our Bibles. And if you came to know Jesus because the word of God was shared to you, then you are an answer to Jesus's prayer in John 17, verse 20. When Jesus prays, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. If you came to know Jesus because someone shared God's word with you, you are an answer to Jesus's prayer in John 17, 20. Which is why it is so important that we are reading our Bibles and we are sharing the word of God with others. Because there's someone else who's gonna become the answer to Jesus' prayer. And we need to read our Bibles and we need to share it with other people. When we talk about our God-sized goal at Big Valley Grace Community Church, which is disciples, making disciples, making disciples, making disciples, it's not an original thought. This is not our original thinking. We did not come up with this. This thought is in result to we want to live out the answer to what Jesus is praying about in John 17, 20. I do not ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. And so as a disciple, we want to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples because we understand that the word of God is going to continue to be shared. And we just want to be a part of the chain reaction of discipleship that's taking place of people passing the word of God along to one another. And it's been happening ever since Jesus prayed this prayer. In 2 Timothy 2.2, the apostle Paul explains for us four levels of disciple making. Disciples, making disciples, making disciples, making disciples. He says in in 2 Timothy 2, 2, and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There are four layers of discipleship in this verse. Let me explain it. The first disciple is the apostle Paul, me. He says, what you've heard from me. So the apostle Paul is disciple number one, what you've heard from me. He says, what you, what you, you is Pastor Timothy. He's he's writing to Pastor Timothy, what you have heard from me. So disciple one is the apostle Paul, disciple two is Pastor Timothy. He says, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men. So faithful men is the third disciple that's identified in this passage, and it's referring to the body of Christ. You can't be a faithful person unless you're a part of the body of Christ. So you have to be a part of the body of Christ to be faithful. So the apostle Paul invests the word of God into Pastor Timothy. Pastor Timothy invests the word of God into the body of Christ. And then it says, who will be able to teach others also. So the others then is either people who don't know Jesus or they're new believers. So it's people who are coming to to know Christ and they're not ready to teach yet, but they're ready to receive it. And so you have the apostle Paul, you have pastor Timothy, you have the body of Christ and you have new believers, disciples, making disciples, making disciples, making disciples. And the reason I share this is every person in our church is to be about disciple making. It is for all of us. We are somewhere on this chain of disciple making. We're all a part of the disciple chain reaction that has happened ever since Jesus prayed this prayer. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So we continue to share the word of God and we continue to discover answers to Jesus's prayer. So if Jesus is praying for us, the next question we should ask is, How does Jesus pray for us? 
What is Jesus praying about if Jesus, just think of this, 2,000 years before we live, 2,000 years before we live, what does his prayer request look like for us? Verse 21, 22, and 23, I'm gonna unpack the first half of how Jesus prays for us. 21, Jesus is praying and he says that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Let's break it down. That they may all be one. Who is the they? The they is those who will come to believe in Jesus through the apostles' word, right? So when we come to know Jesus because of our Bible, Jesus' prayer is that we would all be one. So the first part of his prayer is that we would have unity with other believers. And then he explains there's a standard for that unity. Just as you, so now he's gonna explain the standard. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So Jesus then goes on to explain that the standard for unity is the unity that God the Father and God the Son have together. So what does Jesus pray about when he prays for us? He prays that we would have unity with other believers and that the standard for that unity would be the unity that God the Father and God the Son have. He then goes on to explain another layer that they also may be in us. So not only is the prayer of Jesus that we would have unity with other followers of Jesus and that the standard for that unity would be the the unity that God has, that they also may be in us. He's praying that as believers, we would have unity with God. What does Jesus pray about when he prays about us? He's praying that we will be able to experience unity with God that we would be in God. And when we have unity with one another as followers of Jesus at the standard of the unity that God the Father has and God the Son has, and when we experience unity with God, you know what happens? People look and go, something a little different about that group. Those people are a little strange, peculiar, a little weird. They like like each other. They like do things to help each other out. They like serve one another. They're like there for one another and carry one another's burdens. They like love each other. There's something different about that group. What's the end of the verse say? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. It is about a testimony, a witness that God the Father sent God the Son. When we live in unity with one another, the standard of unity that God the Father and God the Son have and we have unity with God When the world interacts with us, they go, there's something different. What's the difference? The difference is Jesus. It is a witness and a testimony and a validation that God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus Christ. What does Jesus pray about when he prays about us? That's pretty significant. He goes on in verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. So God the Father has glory, the glory that you have. So God the Father has glory. And God the Father gave his glory to the Son, the glory that you have given me. And the Son, God the Son, chooses to give that glory to believers. I have given to them. So the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Why? That they may be one even as we are one. So Jesus goes on and he's praying to the Father and he's praying about us. And what's he praying? He's praying that we will reflect the glory that God the Father and God the Son have. That our lives would reflect the glory of God. And that our lives would reflect the unity that God the Father and God the Son have. That is incredible. What, is, what, what do you think makes Jesus' prayer list when Jesus is praying? This is what he's praying about. Verse 23, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. So I in them, that is God the Son in believers. So Jesus is praying to the Father and he's praying about how he, God the Son, is going to be in us. That God the Son would be in us. And you in me, that God the Father is in us. God the Son, that they may become perfectly one, perfectly, that is whole, that is complete, that's lacking nothing, 
To say it negatively would be that there would be no division in the church. I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, that believers would be whole, complete, connected, together. So why? So that the world may know that you sent me. Again, this is about a testimony and a witness that God the Father sent Jesus Christ, the Son, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. This is about a witness that God the Father sent God the Son and that God the Father loves God the Son and that God the Father loves you. So what does Jesus pray about? If I were to sum up this first three verses of his prayer, I would sum it up in this way, that Jesus prays for us to have a testimony of unity. Unity with other believers. The standard of unity is God. Prays for us to have unity with God, that we would live as a testimony to the world, reflecting the glory of God, reflecting the unity of God, that God, the Son, Jesus would be in us as God the Father is in God the Son, that there would be no division among believers in Jesus, and that when people look at us, it would be an incredible witness that God the Father sent God the Son, and God the Father loves God the Son, and God the Father loves us. So what kind of stuff did Jesus pray about? Jesus prays that we would have a testimony of unity together. Now, the things Jesus prays about, he also taught. So this is in chapter 13. He taught about this in chapter 13. In chapter 13, remember, these chapters that we're in right here, they cover the single evening. A new commandment I give you, that you loved one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So when we love one another, People will look at it and go, they must be followers of Jesus. That must be a disciple of Jesus because look at how they love one another. A new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So Jesus taught the disciples, this is what I want you to do. And in John 17, what we're witnessing is he's praying about it. He's praying that we would have a testimony of unity. Now, we'll continue on in the prayer. So in John 17, we'll look at 24, 25, and 26. So in 25, we're gonna see what Jesus longs for, what he desires. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So Jesus is now praying to the Father that his disciples would be able to see his glory, the type of glory that he had before the foundation of the world. How is it possible that Jesus, in the timeline that he says this, in the earthly timeline that he says this, how is it possible that Jesus is referring to something that happened in his life before the foundation of the world. Well, when we have questions in the Gospel of John, we just need to reread chapter one because chapter one sets up the entire Gospel. And the first five verses of John, it says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That's how the Gospel begins, and it's using the term Word, the name Word, to describe Jesus. So let me reread it for you. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Jesus was, in the beginning, with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is describing the brilliance of Jesus before creation, and then the brilliance of Jesus into creation. And Jesus is praying in John 17, he's saying, God, this is what I want. This is what I desire. I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory. The, the, the type of glory that you gave me 
because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, in the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, and the gospel of Luke, we have an account. And the account is referred to as the Mount of Transfiguration. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is recorded a moment where a sliver a peeling back, a, 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 a parting of the human veil into something much bigger where the disciples see some part of the glory of God in Jesus. And here's what it says in Matthew 17, one and two. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. One of the gospels say that his clothes became like whiter than any bleach could bleach them. Another gospel says that he was dazzling. So Peter, James, and John, God lets them see a little peeling back, a little sliver, a little portion of the glory of Jesus in his eternal glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, John. The gospels that recorded are Matthew, Mark, Luke. Here we are in the gospel of John. John's one of the guys who saw it. And yet John does not give the Mount of Transfiguration account in his gospel. Why would that be? Well, because he couldn't wait in the timeline. When we have questions about John, we just got to go to the ch first chapter because in the first chapter, in verse 14, John couldn't wait to explain about the timeline of Jesus' life before he said, I've seen his glory. In verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Right in, he's 14 verses into his gospel and he's already saying, we've seen his glory. I was there. I was on the mountain. It's like his earth suit got peeled back and we got to see into the eternal Jesus, a sliver, a portion. It was so glorious, it could only be like the glory that the son of God would have, full of grace and truth. Right at the beginning of the gospel, John's already letting us know he's seen his glory. Now, Jesus is here in this prayer and he's saying, I'm praying that my disciples would see my glory. Well, we were not at the Mount of Transfiguration, so how are we gonna see his glory? Well, we have the glory of God in the scriptures. We see the glory of God in the cross. We see the glory of God when the Holy Spirit of God indwells a believer. But there's a future glory that's coming. There's a greater answer to the prayer that Jesus is praying where we will see the glory of Jesus. A vision came about a future glory, and that vision came to the apostle John. It's the same person who wrote the gospel of John that we have been studying. But John doesn't record that vision in the gospel of John. John records that vision in a book called Revelation. And in Revelation, this is what it says about the vision the apostle John had regarding the glory of Jesus. Revelation 21, 22, and 23. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. There is coming a moment when believers will be in a holy city of heaven with God. And God is the light source. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. That's where the light's coming from. We don't need light bulbs. We don't need light switches. We don't need flashlights. And my D-bill's gonna be gone. Not gonna need any of that anymore. Because the Lamb, the Lamb is the lamp. Which is why it's so incredible at the beginning of the Gospel of John, when John the Baptist sees Jesus, what does he declare when he sees Jesus? He says, behold, the Lamb of God. Right there. There he is, the Lamb of God. Not only is he the Lamb of God, but he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That Lamb 
is the same lamb that is the lamp. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the light of the world. So Jesus, he prays that we would see his glory, but he doesn't just pray that we would see his glory. He makes it possible because he goes to the cross as the lamb, the lamb who is the lamp, the lamb who is the lamb of God, the lamb who gives his life for the sins of the world. So he prays that we would have opportunity to see his glory. And then he goes and he ensures that we are gonna have that opportunity. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord God and savior of our sin, we can know we are going to see the glory of Jesus. There is a day coming when we will be in an environment where the light is the glory of God. Verse 25, he continues to pray, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. How can he pray to the Father and say that the world doesn't know God? Why would he pray that way? Well, again, when we have questions in the Gospel of John, we gotta go back to the first chapter in John 1, 9 through 11. It says, the true light, the lamb, that is the lamp, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world because he had glory before the creation of the world. He's coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. So what does it mean when Jesus came to his own people and they didn't receive him? Well, one way we could look at that is Jesus was Jewish and he came to the Jews and the Jews did not receive him. But that is not the fullness of what this verse is talking about. It says he came to his own. This word own means owner. He is the owner of what he came to. And what is he the owner of? He's the owner of it all. And Jesus came to his creation that he owns. And the people of his creation that he is the owner of rejected him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. So Jesus is praying in verse 25, O righteous father, even though the world does not know you, he says, I know you. What Jesus prays about, he taught about. In John 14, six and seven, it says, Jesus taught the disciples, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. So to know Jesus is to know God the Father. And Jesus is now praying. He's, he's praying, the world doesn't know you, but I know you. And if you know Jesus, you know the Father. And then he says, and these, so his disciples, these know that you have sent me. All right, now, sometimes when I read my Bible, I just start laughing out loud. If you read your Bible and you never laugh out loud, I think you're doing it wrong. I think you need to take yourself a little less serious. I think you need to relax a little bit because there's some stuff that's pretty funny in the Bible. And in chapter 16, I see something in the disciples that just makes me laugh out loud. In John 16, verses 29 and 30, this is what the disciples say. Ah, woo, we got it. Eureka, ah, now Jesus, you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Jesus, thanks for like bringing it down to our level. Uh, we now understand what you're saying. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. We don't even have any more questions. This, is, this whole thing has been cleared up for us, Jesus. Thank you so much. This is why we believe that you came from God. You know what Jesus said to them after they said that? You're all gonna fall away. I mean, they are so confident in this moment that they have the whole thing figured out. And right afterwards, Jesus is like, you're all gonna fall away. But how does Jesus pray? Jesus knows this is already gonna happen. And how, this, this prayer is so gracious. Jesus says, and these know that you have sent me. Even though they are about to go fall away from him, he still prays. They know, Father. They know that you sent me. That is an incredible encouragement. Jesus knowing that they were gonna walk away from him, he still prays for them. And he prays about how they knew he was sent from God. The last verse is verse 26 of his prayer. He says, I made, them, I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. 
When we talk about the name of the Lord, the name of God, it, it refers to all of who he is, all of who his person is, his characteristics, everything he accomplishes, everything he wills. And Jesus is saying, I have made all of that known to the disciples. I've made known to them your name. If you wanna do an incredible study to learn about the Lord, just look up a study on the names of God. If you need a, a cheat sheet, come into the altar room. There's a whole wall. It's full of the names of God. We will help your study begin. Just come in for prayer and look at the wall, okay? And that'll be a great start to your study about the names of God because when we see the names of God, it teaches us about the wholeness of who he is. And Jesus is saying, I've made you known to the disciples. I've made known to them your name. I continue to make it known and I make known to them the love with which you have loved me that they might experience your love. Pretty incredible. Now, there's a name I want to share with you. It's one of the most interesting names that I think is one of the names of God. It's a paragraph. It's so long, it's a paragraph. It comes from Exodus 34, and it's after Moses and the people were already having problems, and Moses is now getting a second set of t tablets with the commandments on it. And in in Exodus 34, five through seven, it says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So God comes to say his name out loud. Verse six, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Okay, so God is going to say his name out loud. I hope you buckle up. It's like a paragraph, all right? Here we go. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. The name of the Lord is proclaimed. The Bible teaches us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that our God does not change. He is the everlasting God. He doesn't shift. He doesn't change. And Jesus taught his disciples, he said, I and the Father are one. And in this prayer, Jesus is praying and he's saying, Father, I've made known to them your name. I have made known to them your name. And I will continue to make known to them your name. That the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. If I were to summarize the second part of this prayer, I would summarize it in this way. That Jesus is praying for us to have a place in his presence. He's praying for us to have a place in his presence. And what Jesus prays about, he already taught and in John 14, one through three, we see where he taught this to his disciples. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus taught them he was going to prepare a place for them. And in John 17, Jesus is praying about it. He's praying about the place that he desires for us to have in his presence. And I hope when you look at these seven verses, you're incredibly encouraged because Jesus is praying that we would have a testimony of unity and he is praying that we would have a place in his presence. And so if you're wondering, does God even care about me? Yeah, he cares about you a lot. And we see a prayer that he prays just for us, that we would have a testimony of unity with one another and we would have a place in his presence. And I hope that is a great encouragement to you. I hope that today you are incredibly encouraged that Jesus is praying for you and the prayers of Jesus will be answered. So let's lean in to the answer 
Let's lean in to having a testimony of unity with one another. And let's lean in looking forward to the place we're going to have in his presence. Let's lean in to the answer of Jesus' prayer. Let's stand together. Father God, Lord, we are so grateful and we are so thankful to be able to come and to gather to worship you. And God, we, we have so many shortcomings. We, we fall short in so many ways. And God, we just wanna confess that and acknowledge that. And we wanna say that we are so grateful to you, that you are so gracious to us, that even though you know we will mess things up. You're still praying for us. You're still praying for us to be united together and that that it would be an incredible testimony to the world. And you're praying for us regarding the place that we will have in your presence for eternity. And so God, all we can do is just say thank you. Thank you that you didn't give up on us. Thank you that you don't give up on us. Thank you that your prayers are gonna be answered. God, help us to lean in and to be the answer to your prayers. And so, Lord, we love you. We, we, we say that we love you. We, we know that when, even when we say we love you, we need to love you more. So, God, we love you, and we need to love you more. Help us to love you more. And I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said.